Now, I think this is a great place for us to do some problems, just to review all of these oxidation reactions. So here you go, my beloved students. I want you to show me how to convert molecule 3 into molecule 4. Once you've done that, then please show me how to convert molecule 5 into molecule 6. Since I'll be showing you the answers on the next slide, I advise you to pause the movie right now and first attempt these on your own prior to moving on. So here are the answers. As we look at this starting material, we want to convert it to this product. It's obvious that the product has a stereocenter that has an oxygen in it. We can see that our starting material is an allyl alcohol. So it should be pretty straightforward that we need to treat this allyl alcohol with Sharpless epoxidation conditions. Now I'm not going to require you guys to know which enantiomer or diastereomer of DET to use, minus or plus, in order to get which enantiomer of the epoxide. I just want you guys to memorize that if I take an allyl alcohol and treat it under the proper Sharpless conditions, I can generate either enantiomer of epoxide according to my desires. Now this epoxide still looks different from the product indicated on the previous slide. So what in the world can I do? Well you'll notice that if the only difference between this epoxide and this product is that I've got a methyl group installed here. How in the world could I take a methyl and put it into that carbon right there? Well what I could do is if I had a negatively charged CH3 I could do that. What does that mean? Well it means a Grignard reagent. Give me a Grignard, I've got a the equivalent of a negatively charged methyl. This methyl can then come into that position, pump these electrons up onto the oxygen, and give me this product. Now it's very important for you to, guys to notice the wedges and the dashes here. You'll see that I used my Sharpless epoxidation conditions to install this epoxide in such a way that I got wedges going to this oxygen. In other words, three-dimensionally, that oxygen is coming towards us. When this methyl anion comes in from this Grignard reagent, what side is it going to attack that carbon from? Well, naturally, it's going to attack from the back side, opposite of this oxygen. So that means that this methyl is going to be pointing away from us, or dashed. Once I protonate that, I then get this product. Now, there's another detail that deserves attention here. You might ask the question, Mike, why in the world does the methyl attack this carbon in this epoxide instead of attacking this other carbon? You'll see this other carbon here to the left in the epoxide is theoretically attackable by our Grignard reagent. That would give you a completely different product. Why doesn't it attack the carbon to the left? Well, I'm sure you already guessed that the carbon to the left is a tertiary carbon and is therefore more sterically hindered than this secondary carbon to the right. Therefore, the negatively charged methyl derived from the Grignard reagent will preferentially attack the carbon to the right. Now we'll give you the answer to the second problem. I begin with this starting material, and I've asked you to get this cis, or I should say sin, 1,2-diol. How in the world do I make a 1,2-diol with both of the OHs coming the same direction? You guessed it. Osmium tetroxide followed by peroxide quench. And now we come to some new problems. I want you, my students, to show me how to convert molecule 7 into molecule 8. And once you've done that, please show me how to convert molecule 7 into molecule 9. Once again, since I'll be showing you all the answers on the next slide, I advise you to pause the movie now and first attempt these on your own prior to moving on. So here are our answers. Once again, in the first problem, I want you to take this methylated cyclohexene and convert it into this product. Now, you might initially look at this and say, Mike, that product doesn't look anything like the starting material. How in the world am I going to do that? Well, I'd agree with you that initially, upon looking at this, this product doesn't look anything like the starting material. However, it might help to realize that this product can be redrawn in this way. So you see this molecule over here to the right? You'll notice that this molecule here to the right is exactly the same as this molecule in the middle, our product. All I've done is uh, twisted things around a little bit so that these oxygens are pointing towards each other. Now I've numbered all the carbons in this chain to help you see clearly that these two molecules are exactly the same. 
Now, I hope you'll agree with me that this molecule all the way to the right does look a little bit closer and a little bit more similar to this starting material. So how in the world can I do that? Well, you guessed it. I need to come up with some way of sawing this carbon-carbon double bond and installing oxygens there. There are two different ways of doing this. The long way is to begin by treating this cyclohexene with osmium tetroxide followed by peroxide quench. That will give you a 1,2-diol in which the two OHs are cis to each other. If I take that compound and treat it with HIO4, what it does is it cuts this carbon-carbon bond and converts each of these carbon-oxygen single bonds into carbon-oxygen double bonds, which indeed is the very product that we're trying to get. The shorter way of doing this conversion is to just take our starting material and treat it with ozone followed by zinc water or dimethyl sulfide. That once again cuts, just like a saw, this carbon-carbon double bond and plops oxygens on the ends, giving me this product. Now let's give you the answer to our second problem. How can I convert this cyclohexene to this product shown here to the right? The major difference between this product and the one in the previous problem is that this product has an OH at this position instead of just an H, as we did with the previous one. You might look at this and say, now wait a minute, Mike. This product doesn't look anything like the starting material. I would agree with you superficially, but if you reorient the product to look like this, you can see that it does indeed look closer or more similar to the starting material now. What I need to do is come up with a way of cleaving or sawing this carbon-carbon double bond, plopping oxygens on there, and then somehow getting an OH to appear down here. How in the world can I do that? Well, you might remember that this carbon right here has a hydrogen on it, right? Can I replace the hydrogen with an OH? Yes, I can. In other words, if I could come up with some way of cutting this double bond, and then replacing this hydrogen with an OH and plopping oxygens here, I would get my product. And as I showed a few slides ago, this can be done by doing ozonolysis. And instead of quenching with zinc, water, or dimethyl sulfide, quenching with hydrogen peroxide. Remember, hydrogen peroxide replaces any hydrogen that's stuck to the alkene carbon with an OH. Can we use the reactions we've learned in chapter 20 to do total synthesis? As you're likely now accustomed, I'll be giving you the chance to test your metal on the field of synthetic battle in class. In the meantime, though, don't be shy about attempting some of the synthesis problems from your text on your own. And now we finish. The day is old. We've had our fun. Tomorrow is another one. From near to far, from here to there, funny things are